This week, I am thrilled to bring you a special report direct from Quebec, where I attended both the World Uranium Symposium and the Uranium Film Festival. Why uranium instead of nuclear, you may ask? Because every nuclear problem we have begins with uranium and a shovel. That's part of what I learned, as I heard from almost 300 activists from five continents and 20 nations who shared a wide range of perspectives on the nuclear industry. My report will provide highlights, and then I will give you a glimpse into the many films on nuclear issues that were shown in the first days of the Uranium Film Festival. That report, and much, much more, will be coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 21st, 2015, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. The World Uranium Symposium began on Tuesday, April 7th, and attracted more than 300 attendees from 20 nations on five continents, quite an ingathering of activists. By the time the event concluded three days later, it had taken an historic position and issued a declaration that marks a change in our stance as a movement against the insanity that is nuclear technology. That first morning, in addition to a video greeting from former Japanese Prime Minister Naoto Kan, we received a welcome from Matthew Kun Kom, Grand Chief of the Grand Council of the Crees, the First Nations tribe that served as lead sponsor for both the symposium and the Uranium Film Festival. Later, we had a chance to speak. My name is Matthew Kuncom. I am the Grand Chief of the Crees of Northern Quebec, James Bay, Canada. What led the Cree Nation to take its preeminent position in underwriting and bringing this event and the film festival to Quebec at this time? We have felt many uh, things that come into our society, forestry uh, operators that, that clear-cut and uh, displace our people, flooding that happened with James Bay Hydroelectric Project that displaced our people. And now there was a uranium project started by a company called Stratico that was going to get their permit to do uh, exploration uh, and set up a uranium mine. We decided to say no to uranium. My nation decided, uh, after much research uh, of talking to experts in that field and hearing the so-called experts from, from uh, the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission tell us that all is well, the health environment, we'll, we'll deal with it, we'll deal with our concerns. We had no assurance from them that our waters would, would be protected, that the safety of our communities would be protected, the health of our communities would, would be protected, nor for securing the environment or protecting a way of life, we as hunters, fishermen, and trappers. And so after reviewing all the data and scientific information, it was not easy. But we concluded that we will not allow any uranium to be extracted and that it should remain in the ground. And that is the position that we took and that is the position that we will stand on. How did that lead to your decision to be so crucial to this event being here at this time? Well, any time that, that, that you take a stand uh, on any issue, you know, we stand against uranium, you have to look at your communication strategy, your legal strategy, your political strategy. In our case, where we looked at and heard about the World Uranium Symposium. So we figured we should get involved. We've heard of the Uranium Film Festival. We, said we should get involved. And we should engage some Cree who happens to be a film producer and assign him on a Cree legend called the Wolverine and be able to do a short film of our story and of our struggle in our fight against uranium. And if people wish to know more about the Cree Nation's work against uranium and the stance that you have taken and the actions that you are taking, is there a website they can visit or source for more information? gcc.ca, uh, that's our website. One of the aspects that marked this symposium as different from any other that I or many of the others had attended was the place of honor taken by First Nations and other Aboriginal people from around the world, as well as the esteem in which their women were held and the power they brought forth from their speaking. It marked a different perspective, one that felt completely in balance over the three days of the symposium. Now, the range of profoundly gifted speakers and veteran activists limited my ability to concentrate on any one of them. 
So what follows can be thought of as an audio montage of just a few of the people who provided their expertise to this event. Know that many of them will be appearing in full-length interviews on future installments of Nuclear Hot Seat. In the morning's plenary session on uranium mining and the nuclear fuel chain, Mariette Leferink of Federation for a Sustainable Environment in South Africa spoke powerfully of the devastation created by the mining industry. She revealed that uranium is actually a byproduct of gold mining and that anywhere in South Africa that gold mining takes place, there are elevated concentrations of uranium and daughter radionuclides such as radon gas. And like the eco-cement in Japan, made from the ash of the incineration of radioactive decontamination debris from Fukushima, bricks in South Africa are manufactured using uranium tailings. Ian Fairley, who was featured on Nuclear Hot Seat two weeks ago, spoke on radiological risks of the nuclear industry. He had this to share with us at the symposium. My name is Ian Fairley. I'm a Ph.D., and uh, my area of speciality is the effects of radionuclide discharges from nuclear power stations. Today I gave a workshop on the subject of childhood leukemias near nuclear power stations. Essentially I presented very strong, persistent, repeated, and conclusive evidence as far as I'm concerned that the incidence of childhood leukemia is very much increased near nuclear power stations. This is not just 5 or 10 percent increase, this is a 120 percent increase. That was a 1.2 fold increase, which is quite serious. And indeed, the study that I'm relying on, which have been backed up by other studies, the study that I'm relying on was carried out or commissioned by the German government on all German nuclear power stations. So it's quite persuasive evidence. This has not really received much coverage, certainly in Canada, and I'm here today to broadcast that message that uh, people should be aware that there are risks of living near nuclear power stations. And my recommendations are that pregnant women and mothers bringing up small children shouldn't live within 10 kilometers of a nuclear power station. One of the interesting things is that in Germany, after the government study came out, women voluntarily voted with their feet. They started moving away from German nuclear power stations. Dr. Ian Fairley can be reached at ianfairley.org. Dr. Helen Caldicott shared with her usual clarity, depth, and passion several times from the front of the room. She included information that Canada provided the uranium used in the nuclear bombs America dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Those materials were shipped through Port Hope in Ontario, where a lack of safety precautions led to the radiological contamination of the port and surrounding area, a situation that, of course, has not abated, given the half-life of radioactive materials. Here's what Dr. Caldicott had to say about her most recent attempt to address the problems there. I was invited to speak at Port Hope, and when I got there, I found it was extraordinarily radioactive, and they dumped radioactive tailings and waste for years and years and years. And I, I said that Port Hope should be evacuated from a medical perspective, and the mayor banned me for, from speaking there, the mayor, and I had to go about 50 miles away to speak about Port Hope. <laughs> when was this? About two or three years ago. I want to go back there and stir it up again. <laughs> Dr. Helen Caldicott. We separated into workshops on uranium mining, health, and the environment. And being unable to split myself into four different people, I chose to attend Dr. Gordon Edwards' talk. It's Gordon Edwards from the Canadian Coalition for Nuclear Responsibility. I'm here at the World Uranium Symposium in Quebec City. And the important thing for people to know is that Canada is one of the world's largest producers and exporters of uranium. And it only has two end uses. One is nuclear weapons, and the other is ending up as nuclear waste after being used in a nuclear reactor. So we are calling for uranium to be left in the ground, that just as asbestos, uranium is too dangerous a substance to be brought to the surface. 
It's a beautiful planet. Life is beautiful, and this is really what we should be working towards. As all we have to do is think about our grandchildren, think about the butterflies, think about four billion years of evolution, and ask ourselves, do we really want to reverse four billion years of evolution by our greed and our carelessness? This is an optimistic thought. We have to overcome our destructive tendencies and work towards a really flourishing planet. The fact is that technologically we know how to meet our energy needs using renewable energy. It's been burgeoning while nuclear power has been declining and fossil fuels have been declining. The uh, renewables are coming on strong. And we all have to get behind that and push for a more sustainable future. People can find out more by contacting our website at ccnr.org. During a workshop on radon health effects and uranium effects on maternity care, Michelle Jin shared her expertise. Hi, I am Michelle Jin. I am with Physicians for Social Responsibility in the United States, as well as a public health student at the University of Minnesota School of Public Health. I am most concerned about the vulnerable populations, meaning women who are pregnant and children. They have the highest risk of harms from radiation, So therefore, I am urging for stricter policies and laws on the amount of nuclear radiation that is going to be emitted within our ecosystem and environment. And when we have the stricter regulations, we also need to have enforcement. Just having a policy is not enough. We need bodies and money and people who are going to enforce these policies. To get more information, please visit www.psr.org. During the second set of workshops on uranium mining, health, and the environment, Peter Preble, Director of Environmental Policy for the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, spoke on problems faced by uranium mining in that part of the world. We caught up with him after his presentation. My name is Peter Preble. I'm the Policy Director with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. In terms of credentials, I hold a master's degree in sustainable environmental management and a master's in education. One of the messages that I want to convey is that uh, we've been mining uranium for a long time in Saskatchewan, where I'm from. For the first 10 years, we sold that uranium exclusively for atomic weapons purposes. I think it was one of the great mistakes that Canada made was allowing its uranium to be used by the United States and Britain for exclusively military purposes. Today we're selling uranium ostensibly for nuclear reactor purposes, but we find still that it often makes its way into atomic weapons. For instance, we found that when we sell uranium to the United States today, that uranium is processed in enrichment facilities And a lot of the waste materials, the so-called depleted uranium, never goes to the electricity generation station. It's actually used for hydrogen bomb production instead. We found that to be very discouraging. We've also made the mistake ourselves of selling uranium to military governments in the world like South Korea, people in Argentina when they had military governments. We were selling uranium to them while those governments were actually working on atomic weapons plans. It's incredible that our own government would have made those kinds of decisions. And we sold uranium from Saskatchewan to France when it was actively testing atomic weapons in the Pacific. And now we're about to sell uranium to India, despite the fact that India has not signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which is really a way of undermining that very important treaty in the world. We're happy to see President Obama wanting to see that treaty strengthened and wanting to see the United States sign the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And I would really like to see a strengthened international safeguards regime that prevents uranium from being used for military purposes. And I think that regime needs to have at least three components. One is that every country has to sign the Non-Proliferation Treaty before it can buy uranium. Secondly, every country has to sign the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty saying it won't ever test nuclear weapons before it can buy uranium. And third, there should be a ban on plutonium reprocessing in North America and worldwide because that's the only way of making sure that uranium won't be used for military purposes. Our website is environmentalsociety.ca, and that will take you to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Australia was represented by more than just Dr. Caldicott. 
Several representatives shared on the politics and problem Australia faces from uranium mining, especially by the indigenous people. First, Dave Sweeney of the Australian Conservation Foundation offers a bit of context for understanding the issues. My name's Dave Sweeney. I work with a national environment organisation, the Australian Conservation Foundation, based in Australia, and I do a lot of work around nuclear issues. One of the big concerns that we have in Australia is that we have a lot of uranium and an aggressive uranium mining industry. And in the shadow of Fukushima, which is a continuing nuclear disaster directly fuelled by Australian uranium, we're pushing hard to end this industry and as part of doing that we're pushing hard for this industry to be under real scrutiny and looked at for its performance, not its promises. We want a genuine debate in our country about the costs and consequences of uranium mining. If people are interested in any other information, go to www.acfonline.org.au Debbie Carmody, an Australian nuclear-free campaigner, explains how the political pressure plays out on Aboriginal people. My name's Debbie Carmody. I'm an Anangal Spinifex person from Western Australia. I'm based, I live in Wangatha country, where there's a lot of uranium exploration happening within that whole region. And the most thing of concern for our peoples at the moment in Western Australia is that the state government has announced that they want to shut down about 150 communities, First Nation communities, to remove people from their homelands so that mining companies can have free access and be able to, you know, do exploration and set up mines. Now, this has happened with one community near me, just east of Kalgoorlie, called Kunana, and the way that the government does it because all the communities are government-run, government-funded. So what they do, they ensure that poor management is put in place and then they start withdrawing services from the communities, such as education, health. So then people have to go move into town and so the community becomes deserted and there's no-one living there and then the mining company comes in. So at Kunana at the moment, there's a uranium mining company there and they're in stage two of their exploration. And just explain briefly the problems that people face when they get displaced from their community and have to try and find a new place to resettle. What really happens is that we're refugees within our own country, and so when people are displaced, they live on the outskirts of town, on the fringes of white society. There's a lot of poverty, alcoholism develops, and a lot of health problems, all the rest of it. So people are truly, truly disempowered. That afternoon, we heard about uranium issues and the impact on Native people around the world. The stories of taking over land by force, irresponsible uranium mining, environmental impact and health devastation were the same whether one was talking about the Inuit African tribes, Native Americans, or First Nations people. It seems that uranium mining requires the cooperation or forced compliance of impoverished indigenous people in order to proceed, leaving multiple disasters in their wake. First, a member of parliament from Greenland. Sarah Olswick uh, from the political party Inuit Atakatsigit, which is which I'm the leader of. We are the opposition party in Greenland, the biggest opposition party. We are a no to uranium party. Our current government consists of three different parties that are all pro uranium. So we are still uh, working on raising awareness and keeping the debate alive so that we can maintain a uranium mine free Greenland. We have a website, it's ia.gl. From Africa we learned about uranium exploration that is going on in multiple countries, including Mali and Cameroon. And in case one had the thought that any place on Earth was immune to the impact of uranium mining or other aspects of the nuclear fuel chain, Odontuya Shaord attended from Mongolia to let us know what is happening in that country. My name is Odno. I'm here representing DMNN. It's an environmental NGO in Mongolia. 
It was very important for me to come here and then spread the message because a river is exploring and test mining in Mongolia. And as a result, a lot of livestock in that area dying and having defective offspring. And then people are getting sick too. They think that in situ leaching technology is not very dangerous. It's relatively safe, but it's not at all. It's polluting the groundwater, which the herders depend on. You know, the Gobi Desert doesn't have rivers, so they're just polluting the groundwater and the soil, and they're not doing anything about it. They're not being responsible, and the government cannot monitor because the government is part of this river. And so we have been trying to do everything to monitor, to stop it. And if you cannot prove the technology is efficient, and if you cannot put the water back into the original state, then don't use it at all. That's our message. We have a website called www.dmnn.mn and our Facebook page called DMNN Official. Speaking of social media, now would be a great time to track down all of these organizations and find them on Facebook to join the groups and hit like. That way, we'll all be able to stay in touch with each other. Certain stories of courage and people taking a stand were referred to repeatedly throughout the conference. One of them had to do with a threatened doctor's strike, which changed nuclear policy in the province of Quebec. Listen as one of the participants in that event describes what happened and why she did it. Hi, I'm Isabelle Jean Gras. I'm a physician psychiatrist in the city of Cetil, north of Quebec. I'm part of uh, CAPE, which is the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment. But I became involved with this topic of uranium when I found out that in my town there was a project, an exploration project. So at first, as a mother, I was really worried about my kids. I had young kids, and I was not born in this town, so I chose this town. I said, is it really this that I want for my children? Do I want them to be exposed? So I started to research with other colleagues and we weren't really reassured with our findings. There was not a lot of literature. Uh, so we started being worried, and we wanted to get the public health department involved to investigate and to give the population more information. But we didn't get their cooperation. So uh, eventually we got frustrated, and we thought that the project was moving on. So in a desperate way, we said, you know, because we personally didn't want to stay if they would be a mind. And so we sent a letter to the Minister of Health at that moment saying, you know, if there's a mine, we're all eventually going to leave. And this was all the doctors who were going to leave the town. It was half of the doctors at the hospital that said that they would eventually leave. They didn't want to subject themselves or their family. And they felt obliged telling the population what was going on. So it created a political crisis back then that led to the formation of a committee, uh, which I was part of with one of my colleagues and some citizens and two ministries. And that led to a big analysis from the Institute of National Health of Quebec that pretty much confirmed what we were worried about. We had a right to be worried about because at first the government says, you know, you shouldn't be worried about anything, everything's safe. So basically uh, it confirmed that there was no solid data that could reassure us that it was safe. And since then I, I stayed involved in the whole process. We did something because it was a, a cry from the heart because we weren't heard. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people who are trying to do the same thing. But since it was doctors that said we were finally heard and all the different groups that we heard today, they're not that fortunate that there's some elite, you know, if we can, I can use that word, that speaks out, they won't be heard. So it's a shame. I feel it's part of, of being a doctor that you should get involved for your community. It's not just seeing patient in your office. Back then, nobody was talking about uranium mining in, in Quebec, so the, the fact that the doctors took a stand in, in 2009 made this known to the whole province. We had to take like a, a, a big step 
but I'm glad we did it because it was an important part to what's going on in Quebec, that there's actually no more projects going on and that we have a big hearing right now to seal the faith of uranium mining here in Quebec. So I should hope that if you have doctors listening to your show, that they will also get involved uh, within their communities. No matter what, I think we have a duty to support our communities, their battles. It is important. Day two of the World Uranium Symposium opened with a panel on nuclear power global issues. Michael Schneider from France, who is lead author on the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists World Nuclear Industry Status Report, gave us encouragement. He pointed out that internationally, of 61 nuclear reactors currently under construction, 49 of them have been delayed. That's not a stat you're likely to hear anytime soon from those folks down at World Nuclear News. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds spoke again and pointed out that the only thing that will stop uranium mining is when nuclear facilities stop buying it. Arnie also made the suggestion that we shift our languaging from talking about waste storage to waste abandonment, because that's what the industry is trying to do abandon it to the rest of us. Arnie's talks from the symposium will be posted shortly at fairwinds.com as videos. The following workshops addressed nuclear power ethics. Are there such a thing? Ethics, economics, health, and the environment. This included a session by Dr. Dale Dewar of Physicians for Global Survival, who is also co-author of the book From Hiroshima to Fukushima to You, a primer on radiation. I caught up with her during a very noisy lunch. My name is Dale Dewar. I'm a physician with Physicians for Global Survival. I am their past executive director, and I currently still practice medicine up in Nunavut, the far north. The main takeaway point that I would say is leave uranium in the ground. We do not need more radioactivity in our environment. Everything that we do that adds radioactivity to the environment adds it to our background and our body burden. And we know that increasing radioactivity causes cancer and multiple autoimmune diseases, teratogenic effects, and genetic effects. Thank you. Is there a website people can use to get more information? Uh, You could follow up by going to www.pgs.ca and then click on the newsletters and information library. In the middle of the afternoon sessions, Christian Levesque grabbed me by the arm and pulled me out of a session, telling me that we had an opportunity to make our point in a really big way. Christian, very quickly, what is it that we are doing right now? We're going right now to see all the Prime Minister of Canada that have a meeting here in uh, Quebec City, and we're going to try to show them that Uranium is no good for the development of the future of of Canada. Here we go. We walked across the driveways from the building that we were in, the convention center, to the hotel directly across the street. And that was where the prime ministers of all the provinces of Canada, each province does have its own prime minister, as well as the prime minister of all Canada, Stephen Harper, we're meeting to discuss climate change. We've been able to get into the outskirts of the press area, and apparently the session is breaking up. What we're trying to do is twofold. First of all, ask a question of the Prime Minister, and secondly, get information on the uranium problem in Canada and uranium mining problem in Canada into the hands of the journalists who are here. It's actually a rather brilliant move, and all we had to do was walk across the causeway from where our symposium is being held to where this event is being held. And quite frankly, it's astonishing that we've not only gotten in the front door, but upstairs to the outskirts of the area where the event is taking place. Well, Stephen Harper and his security team managed to leave by a different set of doors. As for the rest... 
Well, we were unable to speak to any of the prime ministers of Canada. However, we were there when they got through, which is an amazing breach of security protocol if this were to happen in the United States. But this is Canada, so I guess they're a bit more relaxed about things. In any event, we were able to get the information, the visibility, into the hands of several of the journalists here and also made connections with other political figures who were recognized by Christian Levesque. After that little Levesquepade, it was time to go on to the opening of the Uranium Film Festival. That night, the two events overlapped as the World Uranium Festival kicked off with a gala red carpet affair. Performers from Cirque du Soleil stalked the room on stilts. There was live music, a cocktail party, a psychedelic drum team light show, and welcome from the lead sponsors, the Grand Council of the Cree Nation. It was quite the scene. More than 300 people attended, and we were greeted by the lead sponsors, the Grand Council of the Cree Nation. Then we watched a short documentary by Ernest Webb, a Cree tribal member, on a legend that speaks directly to the uranium mining issue, the Wolverine, the fight of the James Bay Cree. One Hollywood notable who attended the opening night ceremonies was Ed Begley Jr., well known for his environmental activism and his genuine care for the planet. Here's what he had to say. Ed, you are one of the better known environmental activists within the entertainment community in Los Angeles. What brings you to this festival? I'm here for the Uranium Film Festival because it's such an important issue. It's so toxic for so long, the effects of uranium mining, the effects of nuclear fuel production, the effects of weapons production, nuclear weapons. You know, it's a, it's a long, long life, and I'm so proud to meet here and learn about the incredible, courageous work of the First Nations people here in Canada that are wisely, quite wisely, rejecting the notion of more uranium mining on their lands. I think that's very prudent of them. Have you seen any of the films yet in this festival? We saw a wonderful uh, film about the Cree Nation and their long history of protecting the land and being good stewards of the land and their concern and rejection of more of that kind of toxic activities on their land. They don't want it. They think it's bad, not just for seven generations, but 700 generations. So I think that's something that they needed to do. It's something that they did do, and I'm just proud to meet so many of them here and stand behind them in that prudent decision. What do you think it's going to take to bring Hollywood around to this issue so that they address it in some meaningful way through the products that they are creating? I hope that we get a little bit more support from the Hollywood community. It's such an important issue, you know. PR has helped to fuel the nuclear power industry to grow. After Hiroshima and Nagasaki, nuclear fission had gotten kind of a bad rap understandably, when they saw the damage that was done there. People wanted to end the war, but I don't think they wanted to pay that kind of price with civilians being injured in that horrible, horrible manner. So they decided to come up with a notion of the peaceful atom. And believe me, there's a lot of PR involved in that idea. It was power that was supposed to be too cheap to meter. Well, as we now learn, with the building, maintaining of power plants, the uh, disposal of nuclear waste, the insurance that we all underwrite with the Price-Anderson Act, there's no more expensive way to boil water you can come up with. And I have long investigated and put my money into other forms of energy, that is to say wind and solar. You know, I've had a wind turbine, California does it since 1985, putting out many homes worth of power. I've had solar on my rooftop since 1990. And here's the worst energy-related accident that can occur with my solar panels. Ow! Ed, careful! You didn't bolt that down good. I almost got hit in the head by that panel. Be careful. That's the worst meltdown you can have <laughs> if you didn't bolt the panel down good. It might conk you in the noggin. We don't need to license any more nuclear power plants. We need to move in another direction and stop this insanity that I, I think has too great a price. Actor Ed Begley Jr. at the Uranium Film Festival. One of the great joys of being at this event was the ability to meet in person some of the activists I have known only by Facebook and, on occasion, Skype. Here are two of the regulars on my Facebook page for more than three years, Marius and Candace Paul from Saskatchewan. 
Good afternoon. This is from the Isle of the Turtle. My name is Marius Paul. I am honored to be able to relay a message to all my brothers and sisters that are out there. We have been walking a very challenging road and this trail has led us to a very balanced arena and in that arena are some very, very extraordinarily good people that are just profoundly human in every every way possible, imaginable. My message here is protect the earth. Love the earth. Our web page is Committee for Future Generations All in One dot WordPress dot com. I'm Candace Paul with Committee for Future Generations. I'm the Outreach Coordinator, and I'm also a member of English River First Nation in northern Saskatchewan. The big message that's going around the world right now is leave the damn uranium in the ground. We've known for eons that it has the power to destroy. We call it the demon from underground. The harm that it is now causing ever since they brought it out is irrevocable. We can't clean it all up. We must stop any further uranium mining. Uranium in the tar sand. Right now, there are companies developing tar sands in northwestern Saskatchewan, although they're kind of on hold because of the market. But in northwestern Saskatchewan, unlike Alberta, the uranium is above the oil sands. So they're after both. And if they get after both, We're going to have nothing but a sacrifice zone in our region. We have a website called committeeforfuturegenerations.wordpress.com. The third day of the World Uranium Symposium focused on humans and indigenous people's rights versus the nuclear fuel chain on the international, national, and local level. Many of the indigenous speakers who were interspersed in other panels came together to form a powerful, united, international front, agreed that uranium needs to be left in the ground. After a break for lunch, the festivities seemed to be winding down. We were entertained by performing artist Gilles Vigneault, who sang his original song, Uranium, with the consummate skill of a lifelong cabaret performer. And then we got to meet a group of Cree youth who partook in the 800-kilometer uranium walk from Mysticini to Montreal. It was great to see that many young people so dedicated to the work that we are doing to turn this nuclear juggernaut around. Then, at a time when in most symposia things are winding down to completion and exhaustion, We had a chance to partake of history. At the end of every workshop and plenary session, feedback was requested in written form, and there were questions and space to put in what people wanted the world to know about our beliefs and our stand on nuclear issues. Behind the scenes, this information was compiled and honed and refined and fought over and debated and agreed upon to create the Declaration of the World Uranium Symposium 2015. This is an historic work that recognizes the circumstances that make it necessary to confront the nuclear issue and states our case. I have only a draft, and the entire document is too long to read in its entirety, But here are just a few excerpts from this history-making document. Insisting that nuclear weapons, including those using depleted uranium, be criminalized and that all signatories be held accountable to the obligations set out in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Affirming that it is in the interest of the survival of humanity and of life on this planet that nuclear weapons are never used again under any circumstances, 
acknowledging that the world's indigenous peoples have disproportionately borne the harmful burdens of the global uranium industry, nuclear activities, including nuclear testing, and the dumping of nuclear waste, determined to reduce the burden on future generations resulting from the extraction and use of radioactive substances, dedicating ourselves to a nuclear-free future, we solemnly declare that uranium and all radioactive substances must remain in their natural location. We demand a worldwide ban on uranium exploration, mining, milling, and processing, the reprocessing of nuclear waste, and the irresponsible management and storage of nuclear waste that is not done according to best practices. We demand that all states, authorities, and peoples phase out and eliminate nuclear power generation and use and dedicate themselves to the development and use of intelligent energy services based on sustainable, safe, and renewable energy resources. We call on all states, authorities, and peoples to strengthen their commitments to nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament, to eliminate all existing nuclear weaponry, to cease any and all development of nuclear weapons technologies, and to start negotiations on a legal treaty to ban all nuclear weapons. And finally, we call on all states, authorities, and peoples to ensure that all existing radioactive products, material, and structures from all phases of the nuclear weapons and power systems are secured and managed in accordance with the best and safest available technology for the people, animals, and plant life. We were asked to sign, and, of course, I did, we all did, except for those individuals who needed the approval of their organizations in order to sign. As I held that document, I felt like I was holding history. When the final draft is posted online, there will be a link that I will put out on social media and also have on the website under this episode, number 200. Thursday night, April 15th, marked the first full evening of the Uranium Film Festival. Atom bombs on the planet Earth showed repeated images of atmospheric bomb blasts as if individual frames of film. No narration, just the images. I didn't know whether I wanted to cry, scream, throw up, or simply leave the room. Instead, I stayed and found myself deeply moved by what I saw. If you want to feel outrage, view Nuclear Savage, the Islands of Secret Project 4.1. It chronicles the U.S. military's use of the people of the Marshall Islands as human lab rats to see what would happen when they were exposed to nuclear radiation. Between 1946 and 1958, these people were subjected to the radiation equivalent of 1.6 Hiroshima bombs every day for 12 years. A well-done full-length documentary by former Greenpeace activist Adam Jones Horowitz. The first evening ended with time bombs by directors Guy Elaine Maroest and Eric Ruel, who attended the festival. Hi, my name is Eric Ruel. I'm a filmmaker, and I've uh, co-directed with Guylaine Marois a documentary called Time Bombs. Time Bombs is about the nuclear veterans who were used as guinea pigs in 1957. They were Canadians. There were 40 Canadians, actually, that were sent in Nevada, but they didn't know that they had to endure nuclear testing. They were at the height of the Cold War, of course, and they had to, enter, uh, to endure six nuclear bombs during the Operation Plum Bob. And the guys, actually, when they came back, of course, the veterans, the young veterans, were actually all feeling sick. A lot of them lost their teeth, and a lot of them lost their hair. They had also other health issues. Some of them got children, and they had birth defects. 
But none of them were allowed to talk that they were sent at Nevada. So 50 years later, some of the men get back together and try to fight the government to get recognition and to get compensation. And that is what the film is about. My website, you can reach us at productions with an S, de la ruelle, D-E-L-A-R-U-E-L-L-E, dot com. And you can buy also the film at NFB, the National Film Board of Canada website, nfb.ca. The next night, Nuclear Hope told the story of Canada's nuclear veterans and their fight for acknowledgement by their own government. It contained extended footage of soldiers in trenches facing a nuclear bomb blast in the Nevada desert and then being ordered to and following orders to rush towards it. Here's what the director had to say. My name is Colin Schein. I'm the director of the film Nuclear Hope. Uh, Nuclear Hope focuses on the issue of nuclear waste and what do you do with the most toxic substance the world has ever known. Where do you put it? What do you do with it? You can check out our website at www.nuclearhope.ca. A real find was the German film Final Picture, which won the 2014 Yellow Oscar, which is the highest award of the Uranium Film Festival. I found Final Picture a knockout drama about what people go through the day before a nuclear war begins, the day it happens, and the two weeks immediately afterwards. Nothing flashy, just real people trying to cope with the unimaginable horror of the aftermath of a nuclear war. The film does not overstate its case, but instead sneaks up on you with tremendous cumulative power. It is truly an anti-nuclear weapon that deserves to be played in connection with the non-proliferation talk discussions and anything else to do with nuclear weapons. The film's director, Michael von Hohenberg, came in from Germany for the festival. Hello, I'm Michael von Hohenberg, and I'm a director uh, in Germany, and I directed the movie Final Picture. It's a nuclear war drama, and it's screened on uh, the Uranium Film Festival in Canada. It won uh, last year the uh, Yellow Oscar for the best movie for a student production. And inside that movie, we have something about uh, nuclear war the day before, the day it happens, and the 14 days after. It's not a funny movie, but uh, I'd like to show atomic bombs are the stupidest thing we've ever done. My website, uh, you can find the movie, is finalpicture.de. It's German website, but at the moment I'm trying to do it in English, so enjoy. Also attending from Germany was Final Picture's lead actress, Nadine Badowitz who had this to say. My name is Nadine Badewitz. I'm an actress from Germany, and I'm here for the festival because um, there's a movie shown I'm taking part in. It's a final picture. It's by director Michael von Hohenberg, and the movie is about nuclear war, like when it will happen, then the day before, then the day it happens, and the 14 days after, what will happen to humanity. Not big science fiction, not big... um, effects but it's pretty emotional and it's pretty small and it really touches you and leaves you in a good depressive way to think about like the whole nuclear thing we're doing on this planet and for me it's really important to be here i was so lucky to be part of the symposium as well with all of the scientists and all of the doctors because when i grew up in germany Next to the border to the east, we had Chernobyl, and when I was a child, I can remember we were not allowed to eat anything from the forest, like berries or wild pigs, because there was radiation in it, even though it was so far away. We grew up knowing that nuclear energy isn't a clear and safe energy, because we got affected by it, even France, which is much more away from Ukraine than we were. So it's pretty important for me to be here and to get an awareness for the whole theme. And I'm so glad I could get here to Quebec. And if you want to find out more about the movie Final Picture, you can just find it on Facebook. In a role that could have led to histrionics and overplay, 
Nadine Bonovitz's carefully nuanced portrayal of a woman in ultimate stress for her life resonated deeply. Her transparently expressive face revealed how one's humanity can be at war with one's terror, a haunting portrayal that rang true from beginning to end. I also felt personally impacted by the Australian documentary Protecting Manuwanku, which is about the Australian indigenous people's fight against uranium mining. Ground Zero Sacred Ground was a brilliant short animated film that juxtaposed petroglyphs from the American Southwest and the Trinity bomb blast that took place in New Mexico. And The Battle of Chernobyl, a documentary that provided more information about that disaster than I'd yet encountered. But all the films I viewed, and certainly the others that are filling this coming week's programming, had quality and depth. Kudos to film festival director and co-founder Norbert G. Suchanek, executive director and co-founder Marcia Gomez de Oliveira, and Quebec organizer Christiane Levesque. Now, how do we get this festival into Los Angeles, where it can have some real influence and do some lasting good in the entertainment industry? All viable suggestions will be entertained and passed along to the appropriate people. So now I'm back, and I am expressing my deepest gratitude to all of you who contributed to helping me get to Quebec to cover both the World Uranium Symposium and the Uranium Film Festival. As you heard, I met activists and filmmakers from around the world, witnessed history being made with our declaration, discovered some pretty good films, and brought it all to you in this show. I hope you got a sense of what it was like to be there. And know that there are still monthly expenses for running Nuclear Hot Seat, from hosting and tech support to bandwidth charges. So if you're moved to support the ongoing work of this show, please go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down to the big red Donate button, click on it, follow the prompts, and know that whatever you can do to help, you, yes you, have even more of my gratitude. Activist shout-out, the people I met at this set of events were spectacular. We're all fighting every aspect of the nuclear military-industrial complex, and we're doing a great job. Now, I'm sorry I didn't get to record messages from all of you, nor did I meet all of you, but know that I consider you my tribe, my family, my friends, my co-activists, and some of the best darn people anyone could possibly want to know. Having experienced the excellence of our international activist community, how can we do anything but win? Blessings, gratitude, and safe journey home to you all. And for those of you who I recorded but did not yet use on this program because I ran out of time, you will be showing up in future episodes of Nuclear Hot Seat. So stay tuned every week, because that's how often we're here, every week. Which brings me to today's final thought, which is 200? Who'd have thunk it? This, yes, this, what a marker, is Nuclear Hot Seat episode 2000. What started on June 14, 2011, only three months after Fukushima began, with a cry of outrage on a conference call with only two attendees, has grown to become a weekly audio chronicle of our movement, the battles, the successes, the ongoing struggles, and the outside world's response to our actions. Never a dull moment. You know, when I first started the show, someone said to me, Really? Is there enough nuclear news to fill a 20-minute podcast every week? I swear. I could do 20 minutes a day or longer, and that's just covering the news. Clearly, we're filling a gap. Nuclear Hot Seat can honestly claim to listeners on six continents, having received as many as half a million downloads in a week, and now I am in discussion with four separate broadcast stations that want to carry the show. To those of you who listen in, thank you. You are my lifeblood. To those of you who have allowed yourselves to be interviewed so you can share your expertise, 
Gee, you have taught me and everyone else a lot. And again, more gratitude. And for those of you who wish to get involved in the show, here are some easy, quick ways to help out. If you haven't already, go on Facebook and like Nuclear Hot Seat and friend me, Libby Halevi. You can also follow Nuclear Hot Seat on Twitter at at Nuclear Hot Seat. On the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, if you sign up for a free chapter of my book, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, From Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, what that will do is get you in the queue to receive weekly notices of Nuclear Hot Seat and what the content is of each week's show along with that link. And when you get that information in an email, feel free to share it with your lists, your friends, your neighbors, co-ecologists. The only way this show will continue to grow is to get it out to more and more people. And if you'd like to get involved in a more hands-on way, I am looking for volunteers to help with a number of things with the show, from posting the episodes on Tuesday night on Facebook and elsewhere on the Internet, to somebody who knows WordPress well enough to help me with some persistent glitches, and, of course, anyone with contacts to The Daily Show, satellite radio, or community radio stations here in the U.S. that are looking to pick up quality program on an issue of importance to us all. If you wish to help in any of those ways, or have a good idea that I haven't mentioned here, please send it in an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. And just so you know, next week, even though it's two days after the fact, Nuclear Hot Seat will present our annual Chernobyl anniversary show. Tune in to find out the personal side of what Chernobyl did to people and the environment, a story that continues to this day. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 21st, 2015. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from all the great activist minds that were present at the World Uranium Symposium, the wonderful filmmakers and their products that were at the Uranium Film Festival, all of the individuals who worked so hard to bring both of these events to fruition, and the many friends I made along the way. Theme music for Nuclear Hot Seat is written by me, Sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive can be found on iTunes, where you can subscribe under podcasts, or just check with us every week at NuclearHotSeat.com on the blog page, which is where each week we post a brand new one-hour show, and yes, I am out of my mind. Plus, Our YouTube channel carries the show at Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2015, Libby Halemi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that our stance against nuclear is the very definition of a David and Goliath battle. I just want you to remember David won. So now we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Don't go back to sleep because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.